You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a woman phoning to inquire about house rental. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hello, thank you for calling Iris Rentals. How can I help you? Yes, hello there. I am ringing just to make inquiries about renting a new property, and I came across a listing on your website that I am interested in. Oh yes. I'd like to find out a few more details, if I may. Yes, of course. Can I take your name? It's Mary Collins. The name of the woman is Mary Collins, so Mary Collins has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Hello, thank you for calling Iris Rentals. How can I help you? Yes, hello there. I am ringing just to make inquiries about renting a new property, and I came across a listing on your website that I am interested in. Oh yes. I'd like to find out a few more details, if I may. Yes, of course. Can I take your name? It's Mary Collins. Okay, Mary. I'm just searching our system for the property details. Is there any information in particular that you were wanting? Does the house have a gym? No, the house doesn't have a gym. However, the house has a large swimming pool, which will be great for exercise and really refreshing during the summer. Oh wow, that sounds lovely. What is the general layout of the house? This house is rather unusual, as the living room is located upstairs with the bedrooms, and downstairs at the ground floor is the dining room, which has a lovely view out over the swimming pool. Does the house come with a car parking space on the street? Oh, there's no need for that. The house comes with a big garage where you can park your cars, and there's also a lot of room for storage. It's attached to the house through a door in the kitchen. Oh, that's perfect. It'll make it far easier to carry my food shopping into the house. Oh yes, absolutely. You actually don't even need to take your car to do the shopping, as the local supermarket is just down the street. You can walk the distance easily. Really? How convenient! Is there anywhere near to the house where I can take my children to play? Unfortunately, there aren't any playgrounds nearby, but there is a park near the supermarket that would be great for taking your children for a walk. It would also be a great place for you to meet your neighbours. Yes, that's true. I love taking long walks in the park. I'm sure there will be a playground at the local school anyway. Yes, absolutely. The community has its own primary school, and there is a secondary school in the neighbouring community. So there are plenty of resources nearby for your children's education. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten.
Now listen and answer questions seven to ten. Okay, great. What are the rental costs for the property? The monthly rent is nine hundred and eighty dollars, which is very reasonable considering the size of the house and the amenities that it has to offer. Does that figure include maintenance fees and bills? The bills are not included in that figure, but it does include any maintenance fees for the garden. That sounds like a very reasonable price. We were hoping to move on the twentieth of April. Will the house be vacant for that date? The current tenants of the property are due to leave on the twentieth, but the cleaners will need a few days to make sure that the house is clean and tidy. This would make the house officially available on the twenty-third of April. Well, everything about the house sounds perfect. Exactly what I'm looking for. What date would it be possible to view the property? I have arranged for the tenant to leave the property on Friday, so I can show the house to prospective renters. Would you be able to make that day? Yes, I'm sure I could come on my lunch break. Would one o'clock be okay? I'm afraid that I have a meeting at twelve thirty, so I won't be able to make that time. I have available appointments at ten fifteen and three. Okay. In that case, can we schedule the appointment for ten fifteen? No problem. I'll book it into my schedule. If you wouldn't mind arriving five minutes early, that would be great. Just so we can get started on time. Sure. What is the address? The postcode is G A five eight E R, and the house is number eight on Spring Street. It's the second right off of Bath Street. Okay, that's great. Do you have any more questions? No,、nope, thank you for your help. No problem. See you on Friday. Bye. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section two. You will hear a man talking on the radio about dogs which help people with their work. First, look at questions eleven and twelve. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions eleven and twelve. Well, yes, dogs with jobs is the subject of today's program. Dogs have earned themselves a reputation over the centuries for being extremely loyal, and here's a little story which illustrates just how loyal they are. Just outside the country town of Gundagai in Australia is a statue built to commemorate a dog. A dog which sat waiting for his owner to return to the spot where he'd left him. Well, the story, which was immortalised in a song, has it that the poor dog died waiting for his master, five miles from Gundagai, which is where they built the statue. Now that's what I call loyalty. Now look at questions thirteen to twenty.
As the talk continues, complete the table for questions 13 to 20. Well, because of their loyalty and also their ability to learn practical skills, dogs can be trained to do a number of very valuable jobs. Perhaps the most well-known of working dogs is the Border Collie Sheepdog. Sheepdogs which work in unison with their masters need to be smart and obedient, with a natural ability to herd sheep. Some farmers say that their dogs are so smart that they not only herd sheep, they can count them too. Another much-loved working dog is the guide dog, trained to work with the blind. Guide dogs, usually Labradors, need to be confident enough to lead their owner through traffic and crowds, but they must also be of a gentle nature. It costs a great deal of money to train a dog for this very valuable work, but the guide dog associations in the UK, America and Australia receive no government assistance, so all the money comes from donations. Another common breed of work dog is the German Shepherd. German Shepherds make excellent guard dogs and are also very appropriate as search and rescue dogs, working in disaster zones after earthquakes and avalanches. These dogs must be tough and courageous to cope with the arduous conditions of their work, and so that they can be sent anywhere in the world to assist in disaster relief operations, effective dogs and their trainers are now listed on an international database. When you arrive at an airport here, you may be greeted in the baggage hall by a detector dog, wearing a little red coat bearing the words quarantine. These dogs are trained to sniff out fresh fruit as well as meat, and even live animals hidden in people's bags. In order to be effective, a good detector dog must have an enormous food drive. In other words, they must really love their food. At Sydney Airport, where there are 10 detector dogs working full-time, they stop about 80 people a month trying to bring illegal goods into the country. And according to their trainers, they very rarely get it wrong. Another famous working dog is the Husky. Huskies, which originally came from Siberia, have been used for decades as a means of transport on snow, particularly in Antarctica where they have played an important role. Huskies are well adapted to harsh conditions and they enjoy working in a team. But the Huskies have all left Antarctica now because the International Treaty prohibits their use in the Territory as they are not native animals. Many people were sad to see the dogs leave Antarctica, as they had been vital to the early expeditions and earned their place in history along with the explorers. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3 You will hear a conversation between a student and her professor talking about a summer course. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Hello, Mr. Thompson. May I speak to you for a minute? Of course. Please come in. I'm Alexandra Jones. I'm studying sustainability here at the university, and I heard about the summer course that you offer every year. 
I was considering joining the course and wanted to ask you some questions about it. Yes, of course. Please fire away. Has the course been effective in improving the environment? Yes, absolutely. We have seen great results. Last year, we planted a small field of trees, and we have been measuring their oxygen outputs to see the benefits that they have provided to the environment. Since we were regulated by law last month, we are now able to hugely enhance our efforts. Our current goal is to introduce a lot more tree species to the plot, so that we can establish a complex habitat and compare the benefits of each species. In order to do this, we need to get a lot more students involved in the project. So I am very pleased to hear about your interest. Well, the project sounds fascinating. I would definitely like to be involved. Absolutely. Over the years, we have received funding from private investors and from selling shares. But the biggest improvement in our research came from a government fund that we received in the first year. This has greatly improved the organisation, and we have since won prizes for our research. Wow! How impressive! Yes. It is of the utmost importance to our organization that we find a way to repair the terrible damage that has been done to the environment by the human species. This is no small undertaking, and our resources still need management. But from reports taken of our studies, we have found that teachers and students have greatly benefited from field trips to the tree plantation. Yes, I visited the plantation myself on a field trip two years ago, and I found myself greatly impressed by it. We have received a lot of feedback from visiting groups, telling us how impressed teachers, researchers, and students alike have been during their visits. Due to the educational facilities that we have carefully structured, I know that the visits are useful and engaging for students. And that their experience is particularly special. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. So, what is the particular focus of the organisation and the reports that it provides? I am personally very interested in soil erosion, so I knew that I definitely wanted to focus some of the report on this area. Before I set up the organisation, I looked up information on what areas were currently being researched. And I found that there were already studies into air pollution and water pollution. I obviously wanted to find a unique area to research, and so these were no good. I was tempted to look into the background of overgrazing, but the impacts of forest exploitation are far more devastating, and very little research has been carried out on this subject. So I decided that this should also form some focus for the report. Yes, that makes sense. What have you found to be the greatest benefits of the activities carried out by the organisation? I have found that the greatest benefits are not the ones that anyone can learn from a book, like how to collect data, but more importantly, are life lessons that one can gain only from experience. Students who have partaken in the summer course have massively enhanced their confidence. Which will prove invaluable for the rest of their lifetime. The people who partake in the summer course already know the importance of environmental protection, so it is not important that we spend time teaching them this. Students instead benefit from learning the importance of punctuality, as each day they have to wake up early to make sure that they are not late for their practical experience sessions.
If I decide to attend the summer course, what will I be doing for the rest of the time when no activities are going on? Well, we unfortunately don't yet have a library on site, so you would be unable to read reference books. Although you are obviously welcome to bring some books of your own with you, we offer a range of fun hobbies, such as games and painting, for students to participate in outside of their classes. So you could participate in one of these activities. We do not offer tutorials outside of the scheduled classes. However, you are free to interview teachers and ask them any questions you may have about the research. Well, the course sounds fantastic. I would definitely like to participate during the summer. Thank you so much for your help. No problem at all. Here is a form with all of the details. I look forward to seeing you there. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section four. You will hear a talk about memory in babies and young children. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-five. We are going to look today at some experiments that have been done on memory in babies and young children. Our memories, it's true to say, work very differently depending upon whether we are very old, very young, or somewhere in the middle. But when exactly do we start to remember things, and how much can we recall? One of the first questions that we might ask is: Do babies have any kind of episodic memory? Can they remember particular events? Obviously, we can't ask them. So, how do we find out? Well, one experiment that's been used has produced some interesting results. It's quite simple, and involves a baby in its cot, a colourful mobile, and a piece of string. It works like this: If you suspend the mobile above the cot and connect the baby's foot to it with the string, the mobile will move every time the baby kicks. Now you can allow time for the baby to learn what happens and enjoy the activity. Then you remove the mobile for a time and reintroduce it some time from one to fourteen days later. If you look at this table of results at the top two rows, you can see that what is observed shows that two-month-old babies can remember the trick for up to two days, and three-month-old babies for up to a fortnight. And although babies trained on one mobile will respond only if you use the familiar mobile, if you train them on a variety of colours and designs. They will happily respond to each one in turn. Now, looking at the third row on the table, you will see that when they learn to speak, babies as young as twenty-one months demonstrate an ability to remember events which happened several weeks earlier. And by the time they are two, 
Some children's memories will stretch back over six months, though their recall will be random, with little distinction between key events and trivial ones. And very few of these memories, if any, will survive into later life. So we can conclude from this that even very tiny babies are capable of grasping and remembering a concept. Look at questions thirty-six to forty. Now answer questions thirty-six to forty. So, how is it that young infants can suddenly remember for a considerably longer period of time? Well, one theory accounting for all of this, and this relates to the next question we might ask, is that memory develops with language. Very young children with limited vocabularies are not good at organizing their thoughts. Though they may be capable of storing memories, do they have the ability to retrieve them? One expert has suggested an analogy with books on a library shelf. With infants, he says, it's as if early books are hard to find because they were acquired before the cataloging system was developed. But even older children forget far more quickly than adults do. In another experiment, several six-year-olds, nine-year-olds, and adults were shown a staged incident. In other words, they all watched what they thought was a natural sequence of events. The incident went like this: a lecture which they were listening to was suddenly interrupted by something accidentally overturning. In this case, it was a slide projector. To add a third stage. And make the recall more demanding. This accident was then followed by an argument. In a memory test the following day, the adults and the nine-year-olds scored an average seventy percent, and the six-year-olds did only slightly worse. In a retest five months later, the pattern was very different. The adults' memory recall hadn't changed. But the nine-year-olds had slipped to less than sixty percent, and the six-year-olds could manage little better than forty percent recall. In similar experiments with numbers, digit span is shown to vary enormously. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. It's not a game. It's a red stick.